Hello and welcome to the Walrus Leadership Forum, Strengthening Canadian Journalism. I'm Jennifer Hollett, Executive Director of the Walrus, and we're thrilled to be joining you online today. We'll start by acknowledging the land that we're on as part of our larger conversation today on narratives, storytelling, and voice. The land isn't neutral. There is a history, there is colonization. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize where the story starts, what happened in the past, thinking about how it informs where we are now, as well as what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. I'm in downtown Toronto, to Toronto, and I come to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples. Toronto has long been a meeting place of Indigenous peoples, and we're honoured to carry on a tradition of conversation. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on, wherever you are, and this moment in history that we're in. A bit more about the walrus. The walrus started 18 years ago, really as an optimistic project to tell the stories and foster conversation across Canada. And we do that in a variety of ways through our journalism and our print edition of The Walrus, but also online at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, as well as a, in our event series, which are now online like this one. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you all for being here with us. We're a charity, uh, not for profit, and the support of our sponsors in convening is crucial. We are so excited to be partnering with Carleton University on this event. To begin this conversation on strengthening Canadian journalism, advancing representation, and creating a culture of equity, inclusion, and belonging, I'd like to welcome Dr. Benoit Antoine Bacon, President and Vice Chancellor of Carleton University, to share his opening remarks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Welcome, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. I hope you're all safe and well in what continues to be challenging circumstances. It, uh, it's been quite a year, but there's light. There's light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. I'm, I'm glad to share that I received my first dose of vaccine last week on our beautiful campus. And uh, I'm sure many of you also had that opportunity. So we keep going. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, today in this great partnership with the Walrus. Uh, always a pleasure to partner with you and your team, uh, Jennifer, uh, to engage in uh, what I would call a critical conversation on equity, inclusion, and belonging in journalism. Social inequalities uh, that have deep historical roots continue to happen uh, in our communities, across the country, around the world, really. And, and universities are very much part of that world. We're not insulated from these societal challenges. I'd say the media and academia both shape public discourse, and there's a there's a shared responsibility here to, to work together to promote and foster a more just world. If we don't change, if our institutions don't change, then nothing will change. So I'm so glad that uh, today's conversation on strengthening and modernizing Canadian journalism is taking place. Uh, open conversation, debate, education is the only way to bring about positive long lasting change. And of course, we're, we're having these kinds of, of conversation across uh, Carleton University in our in our community of over 40,000 people. We're a diverse community. We always strive for inclusion, but we must be more explicit, more intentional, more strategic in addressing systemic issues across our academic mission and operations. And that objective is clearly, clearly stated in our new strategic integrated plan and now operationalized in our new, very bold, very ambitious equity, diversity and inclusion action plan. Uh, the work is a very uh, important uh, a part, uh, not only uh, of the way we conceive ourselves, of our values, but of our continued success as a modern uh, institution. We're working hard to implement all the recommendations of the EDI uh, action plan, and I'm happy to see this world unfolding across the university, including very much in our flagship uh, School of Journalism. Our journalism program, as you know, the oldest journalism school in the country uh, is changing. We're reflecting on all our practices. We're recognizing our critical role in creating a more equitable future in the industry. 
And the school is working very closely with students. It's very well done to address very real concerns about lack of diversity and inclusion uh, in the program. And we're taking actionable steps to create positive change. We wanna be at the forefront of this change. Uh, and this is part of the conversation today. We're very proud uh, to welcome Nanaba Duncan, our host tonight uh, to Carleton as the inaugural CARDI Chair in Journalism, Diversity and Inclusion Studies. This is uh, a first of its kind role uh, in a Canadian journalism school. Uh, we're leading the way and will advance EDI in journalism education and the media uh, industry. So a warm uh, welcome, Nanaba, who's uh, not yet officially on the ro roster, but uh, is working uh, without a paycheck. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here today and Nanaba to lead us uh, through this important uh, conversation. Uh, you might have seen that last week, we also announced that CBC's Adrian Harewood is joining Carlton. Welcome, Adrian. Uh, these very important changes are the beginning, uh, not the end. Much work remains to be done to drive critically important systemic changes in higher education, in journalism, and across society. So on behalf of Carlton, I want to thank the Walrus, our panelists, for leading this important conversation today. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, everybody, and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Dr. Bracon. Now, as someone who has studied journalism and public policy, I've also worked as a journalist and now as an executive director. Today's conversation is such an important one. I wanted to become a journalist, like many young aspiring journalists, to shine a spotlight on the issues that matter. And that includes, that includes shining a spotlight on our own industry. Today's discussion is not a new topic or conversation, but there is a renewed commitment to this work and a sense of urgency following last summer's call for racial justice. And it impacts not just those of us who work in media, not just those who are underrepresented in media, but anyone who reads, listens, or watches media, and that is all of us. Our format today is dedicated to a thoughtful, moderated discussion with an audience Q&A. So we invite you to submit your questions via chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, thank you to those of you who submitted questions in advance. We're also excited to see that we have audience members from across the country, including Bowen Island, Saskatoon, and Dartmouth. We also encourage you to share how you're watching as well as your thoughts and reflections on social media. Make sure to tag us at The Walrus. To lead our conversation, I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Nanaba Duncan. Nanaba, as mentioned, is the incoming inaugural Cardi Chair in Journalism, Diversity and Inclusion Studies at Carleton University's School of Journalism. At present, she is a William Southam Journalism Fellow at University of Toronto's Massey College. She's studying the experiences of racialized leaders in Canadian media. She's also a broadcast journalist and the founder of Media Girlfriends. She's also a dear media girlfriend to me. Welcome to Nava. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be part of this discussion and I'm honored to be moderating today. Just like many other sectors in Canada, journalism has been experiencing a renewed outcry to address racism against Black, Indigenous, and other people of color and discrimination based on ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and ability. And so I'm really happy to, to be here to talk about this, to talk about what the opportunities are for change and for growth across the field and the importance and the impact of those ideas and the actions. So right now I'm gonna introduce our panel and then uh, we will have our discussion and we'll get to the questions just like Jennifer talked about. So first, Candice Callison. Candace is an associate professor at the School of Journalism, Writing and Media and the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. She's also an author and she co-authored Reckoning, Journalism's Limits and Possibilities, which came out last year. And if this topic is something you're interested in, I highly suggest that you buy that book. Candace is a citizen of the Taltan Nation. She's a former journalist and a regu regular contributor to the podcast Media Indigena. Candace, hello. Hello, and thanks. Yeah, of course. Next, we have Arvin Joaquin. 
Arvin is an award-winning journalist and editor today. He's a video journalist with Omni Television's Omni News, Filipino edition. Before that, he was an associate editor at Extra Magazine. He wrote the digital uh, publishing award-winning newsletter, Extra Weekly. And last year, he was named as a finalist for Best Emerging Writer at the National Magazine Awards. And his work has appeared at many outlets, including the Huffington Post, Global News, CTV News, and CBC. Arvin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Hi, Nineveh. Hi. Reshmi. Reshmi Nair has covered breaking news stories as a reporter for local newscasts and radio stations. Today, she anchors CP24 Tonight with Nick Dixon. Uh, Reshmi started her broadcasting career with Va uh, Mountain FM. She continued as a radio reporter with News 1130, winning an Edward R. Murrow Award for spot news coverage of an oil pipeline rupture in Burnaby, BC. She later moved to television with CTV News, then CBC News, and last year, she went back to CTV to host CTV News Night before moving on to CP24 last fall. Reshmi is also the internal ombudsperson of, CBC, of CTV News. Reshmi, hi. Hi, thank you for having me. And Tara Weber. Tara is the Western Bureau Chief for BNN Bloomberg, covering the energy industry and other issues of interest from Western Canada. She's got an MBA in Global Energy Management and Sustainable Development from the University of Calgary's Haskain School of Business. She also has a journalism degree from Ryerson and a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and Anthropology from UBC. Tara is Canada's first national correspondent to use a wheelchair. Tara, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. So am I. And I'm going to warn everybody that I have a five-year-old downstairs. I don't know what's going to happen. I've told, I've told this child what to do, but we don't know. Um, so welcome to everybody. We were, we were all there when the companies that we wor work for or study or keep an eye on announced or renewed their commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion, or EDI, or DEI. They were prompted by the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd was murdered by police. There were calls around the world to acknowledge the value of Black lives and create more anti-racist environments at work. And in general, to have a better environment at work for diversity in, in, like, in, in general. And a lot of the efforts for change are originally rooted in activism and in social just justice and the need to redistribute power. So we're gonna start this conversation looking at how the current EDI, equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives are being shaped and who they're actually serving. So Reshmi, I wanted to start with you because you actually took the initiative to create and take on the role of internal ombuds at CTV News. So from your perspective and with your internal ombuds hat on, how do you find the initiatives going are, are going on there? Uh, it was um, inspiring to have that conversation uh, with management and say, it, it came up as, look, there are conversations on the side and there are conversations around the meeting table. Do we all want to have the same conversation? And the answer was yes. So that's how the internal ombudsperson position was created. And essentially I am that person who anyone who wants to flag anything, as you said, Nanaba, in the workplace or in our work, uh, our editorial coverage, uh, banners on TV, headlines on websites, anything that's of concern during the process of putting that journalism together or the final product can be flagged to me anonymously. We have a conversation about it. It gets flagged then to management and it has a, a team effort tone throughout the entire process. I think that's really important because sometimes the sensitivities when we bring up, hey, we need to flag something can be received in a negative light. So I would say that there is work to be done. I have a couple of issues that have been flagged and are being discussed right now, especially since, um, you know, the, the coverage of Derek Chauvin and that trial. And then that news release came out, the original press release that the police put out about George Floyd's death. We're all talking about that now about what is our responsibility now when we get a police news release. Specifically in CB24, we're all news all the time. Do we just take that for what it is or do we stop and ask questions? Are you, are you finding that this kind of interrogation is actually happening to more people within the newsroom? Are you actually sensing that people are willing to move on their understanding of what that kind of 
uh, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, another example I, I can give is um, Elliot Page. And right. I, I immediately, uh, be, because, and this is, I'm learning as we go. We're all learning as we go, right? So I know uh, people with pronouns that are new to people in other newsrooms. And now I, when Elliot Page, when the news broke, I said, we cannot dead name Elliot Page. And there were questions. And I wrote it in an email and people asked questions. And there were some conversations, I'm going to be really honest with you guys. One person said, at what point does this end? And we all kind of looked and said, wait, what's the question? <laughs> at what point does what end? That we adjust and adhere to respecting somebody's identity, I think that is going to constantly be moving and changing and, and, and be as fluid as it should be. So we're always having those conversations. I think to have the role that I have is to at least um, not make it personal between anybody, right? Um, a subordinate, a manager, an employee, a viewer, whatever it is, right? Some people have come to me and said, my family was concerned about our coverage. Well, that's valid. Let's talk about that. So I think it's important. It's integral. And I, I really do appreciate our management at CTV News because they see it too. And we're making progress. Uh, Candice, in your work, you've studied legacy media and different media startups. From what you've observed about the changes that le legacy media has been making, what are some companies, what are companies missing as they shape those changes? Well, in this book that I co-wrote with Mary Lynn Young, we argue that you can only do so much repair. And I think that that's the, the sort of the front line that Reshmi is talking about, about trying to establish good methods within an organization to have those deep and difficult conversations. Like that's, you know, part of repair. Um, acknowledging the, the prior harms of journalism um, and acknowledging that journalism can do good work, right? Journalism is a suite of tools, I like to say, and a way of, of getting to uh, narrating what's going on in the present and, you know, narrating how systems and structures have continued to, uh, you know, basically oppress and dispossess and disenfranchise many communities, right? So, so how do we begin to think about what's great and what needs to be repaired? And so I think that that's the conversation really going on in a lot of legacy newsrooms. And it's difficult because there's not many black indigenous or other people of color, you know, there's just not the representation in the newsroom. So those conversations are only going to be more difficult until we have more representation in the newsroom and at the upper echelons. Mm. Yes, I'm with you on the upper levels, uh, on the upper levels thing. Um, Arvin, what kind of initiatives have you heard about or been part of that actually seem to be moving the needle? I think it's about, um, I've heard about uh, the drive to bring more BIPOC journalists in newsrooms, but I just also want to note that not because you're hiring someone, um, I feel like it's a superficial thing almost, because not because you bring someone in um, doesn't mean that you take care of that person. You have like the real test I think comes from nurturing the talent, how you treat people. And right now at its current state, I think journalism and the media industry, uh, especially like EDI in like the current form, I know it's changing, but it is mostly serving institution. It serves like a pat in the back and not really the people that you bring in so but why do you say that why do you say that it's a pat on the back um because some people think that uh just because um say i'm a filipino like a filipino person is here um means that you meet your diversity quota mm -hmm. and that's it but um how i thrive in the organization is a different experience it's a different question um, something that I have heard is um, very close to this, where it's that um, there is frustration when when uh, companies start talking about the numbers and how they're going to bring in more diverse people. But I always say, how would how are they going to feel when they get there? You know, like it's it's very um, it is it is an, a very important step. But there is frustration from uh, many people of color or people from underrepresented and 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 uh, uh, misrepresented communities to just hear that oh we brought a, a lot in. Well, for goodness sake, if I come in and I don't feel comfortable, I'm not going to do my job very well, right? 
So I, I, I appreciate I appreciate you bringing up that point. Tara, when it comes to changes that need to be made in our newsrooms, one of your concerns has to do with acknowledging the management of time and navigating extra considerations when you're in a wheelchair. Can you describe that? Yeah, that was a really interesting conversation you and I were having because I was thinking about the burden that's often placed on underrepresented groups. And one area in which I've really had to deal with it is, is the issue of time in terms of I've worked in buildings that haven't been great to get in and out of. And so I've had to manage that into my day. And then when I get to a location, I may be in a situation where I have to hunt down that one security guard who has the key to the loading zone or the elevator I can use or the back door. You know, I have to figure out where a facility might be that I could use, whereas nobody else has to think about those things. And yet it's something that I have to do on the exact same deadline as everyone else. And I think that's really where we often lose sight of that. We don't consider the extra things that certain journalists have to deal with that maybe their peers don't. And just on Arvin's point a short minute ago, you know, I think one area as well um, that a lot of companies are doing is they're trying to also fulfill their ESG requirements. So coming at it from a business perspective, they know that it looks good on them when they fulfill that social and governance side of things. And so I think this is where we have a bit of a disconnect. Sometimes they want to bring in um, more people from underrepresented groups because sometimes it makes them look good as well and they know it's going to bring in better audiences. Um, have you actually talked to other people about that, the navigating of the time, the same amount of time that everyone else has? Like, do you let people know about that? To be fair, I don't. I think that's another I'm not thing. saying that you have to. I'm just wondering <laughs> if you talk about it. I, I don't. You know, at the end of the day, I think it's one of those things where we always try to excel and not make ourselves look bad when we're from an underrepresented group. You know, you strive, you try harder to fit in. You know, I, speaking about one time in which I did was this horrible elevator I had to use multiple times a day at work. And, you know, it was, it did end up affecting my ability to do my job. And I do remember going to one of the operations managers after it had broken down multiple times after, you know, I got piggybacked up and down the stairs to do my job. And he turned it into a bit of a psychoanalysis where he said, you know, maybe you would be more okay with the elevator if you were more okay with being in a wheelchair. And I didn't respond to that. I think I was quite shocked, mm -hmm. but I think I also, in hindsight, the longer I left it, the more angry I got about that situation. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak up more. Um, I, I, the shock that you described, I have had that feeling. And I know what you mean, where you just are so taken aback by a comment that demonstrates such a lack of understanding. It's such a lack of understanding. And, you know, um, I, I want to speak to some of the changes that have been made. I'm aware and, and how we, we have uh, described our frustration about um, some of these lower level or cosmetic changes um, to, to, to make these larger changes when it comes to equity and, and, and inclusion. And I have to say that uh, my experience at, at, at CBC, I actually did notice that there was, there was quite a change, having been there for 14 years, there was quite a change this time around in terms of like some of the personal conversations that I had with people. I could sense that inside folks who I don't know that they really ever talked about this, I could really sense that there were some changes happening. And I can say for sure at CBC that on top of, and this is going to sound like I'm trying to gas CBC, but I, I do want to just acknowledge that I know that there are some changes happening. And also coming into a, a new institution at a leadership level, sometimes the changes that are happening, you everyone doesn't know that they're happening. Everyone doesn't know that they're, that they're coming. So um, I just want to acknowledge that point. Now I want to get to uh, what happens when you're the one or one of a few that is making a call for change, particularly when you're coming from a community that isn't represented or is misrepresented. When you criticize the system that you work in, there's tension, there's apprehension, there's courage involved. I can say for my part, it's some, it, I have been part, uh, I was directly involved in leading a group of black employees at CBC uh, to issue a call to action to the president, Catherine Tate and the senior executive team. It's not easy when you speak up because you feel like you put a target on your own back. 
I can say that's how I felt the next morning. And you don't want to be seen as a troublemaker. You just want to do your work, but you know you're saying something that's true. So what I want to ask um, you, Reshmi, first, what are your initial thoughts on this, on being that person? Whew. I, mean, I know. I got to say, I've been in the industry for 15 years and only recently, a year ago, I said to uh, a boss who was about to hire me, I grew up in Rexdale. And he said, amazing. And I looked around like no one's ever reacted that way when I said I grew up in Rexdale. So in this newsroom that I'm in right now uh, with vaccine equity and uh, the rollouts, uh, Rexdale has been in my heart. My family's in Mississauga right now, but man, I, I, so I, I would say 15 years ago, I would think this is too personal to me. I can't pitch this as a story. Maybe I'm too biased. Does anyone else care about Rexdale and brown families that have tons of generations in them and essential workers so that has shifted in that i just kept flagging it to people in the newsroom and they kept going yeah this is an issue and i have to say though that with the uh number of doctors coming forward on the issue as well it's new to canadian media to have so many voices from healthcare bravely speak publicly on issues. We don't see that in Canada. You see that in the US, but you don't really see that in Canada. So during this pandemic to have, um, we had a doctor come on uh, and, and call it systemic discrimination. And then, you know, he told me later that people said he was calling the premier racist. Well, no, he's not calling the premier racist. He's saying that these fractures in our society have elevated and become louder and are hurting more people through this pandemic. So um, it is changing people are caring more, but I see it on all fronts. If we didn't have those doctors, as a journalist in the newsroom, if I couldn't find that voice for the story, could I get that story on air? Uh, are I, you saying that it's now a little bit easier to be the one to speak up? Yeah. Yeah, it's just starting to become more comfortable. And uh, and I can say I'm from Rexdale proudly, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Arvin, what about you? In your work, you've always worked to, diversity, to diversify narratives and share cultures. What is the impact of constantly being in that kind of space, navigating the speaking up, knowing when to do it, how far to go, et cetera? I don't have uh, where to start. Um, Let's start like... at the beginning or the middle. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I feel like, um, sure, like you mentioned, this is where tension starts it is hard for BIPOC employees to speak out, especially when you're part of the organization. But I think um, this is also an opportunity for institutions to like flip the conversation that the BIPOC employees who are speaking out actually care about your organization. They want your organization to do better. They want society to be better. They want your workplace to work for them as well. So I feel like there's just a disconnect that once a BIPOC employee speaks out, like they are seen as an antagonist where like that's, we need to shake that narrative. Like we are not there to challenge organization. Like I feel like there's- um, We're there not? Some we are challenging institution, but um, it's not from like an evil place. Mm. Like we meant well. Mm. Um, and I feel like they just see us as, um, you know, like coming from a bad place and want to dismantle the system. We want the system to work for everyone. I Do we not want to dismantle this. the system? Does anyone here want to dismantle the system? I mean, I, I hear what Arvin's saying in that we don't want to be considered disruptive in that editorial mm -hmm. meeting. We, we want our perspective and our opinions to be treated with the same level of, of, of respect, right? So it's not that, I used to be called the firecracker in our radio newsroom. And I liked it. And why is that? Well, now when I think about it, I don't think that's fair, actually. <laughs> you <know>? I hear <laughs> you. <laughs> so that's what I think. I, I don't want to speak for you, Evan, but that's what I'm hearing from you, too, is that you don't want to be, when you bring your stories and your perspective, you don't want to be labeled as, as a disruptor. You want to be labeled as a contributor. Yeah. And yeah, and just to like add to that, and I feel like for years, um, this system treats BIPOC employee as a disruptor. And without even like being listened to and um, uh, like, you know, understood where they're coming from. It's like the, the default um, re reception. Candace, you want to say something? 
Oh, I, I, I mean, so I'm coming from the academic side. And Please bring it. <laughs> and I think that the, it's a really an open question. I've been on a, a bunch of panels lately uh, with Black, Indigenous, Muslim journalists who are asking that question, like, do we want to save journalism if this is what it is? How can we really think past just mere repair and think about reform and think about transformation? Like, how do we begin to move this industry so that it serves all publics, the diverse public, so that we're not asking who isn't it serving, right? We're asking how can we serve? So I think like those are, you know, sort of broad questions. And, and for me, like as an academic, I didn't expect to come back to journalism after I got a PhD. But when I did, this was the question I continually asked. I mean, I've been in the room with academics and journalists and said, hey guys, look around the room. <laughs> what do we see? We see mostly white men, right? I, I mean, I've, I've said those kinds of things in every chance I've gotten to because of my position, right? Because as an academic, I can ask those kinds of- What's the response like? Uh, silence, yeah, generally, or sort of like, oh, another, you know, mm. <laughs> another person asking that question. But mm. I think that the response is changing. Like, I do think this this past summer with Black Lives Matter, with what you guys did with uh, CBC Black Calls to Action, I do think there are sort of broad conversations happening that I couldn't have even anticipated when we started writing this book, you know, five years ago about reckoning, like that we called it reckoning is sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> somewhat- You had your hands on that surprising. crystal ball, my friend. <laughs> you really did. Um, Tara, what, what about you? Like, wh where are you on speaking up for others who use wheelchairs? You know, I find it an awkward situation because I, I don't in general. Like, I tend mm -hmm. to shy away from doing those sorts of stories because, you know, you don't want to be pigeonholed or put in a box in a certain way. And I think as I've gotten a bit older, now I... I kind of regret doing that a little bit. Now I have a certain beat. I cover a lot of business. So it wouldn't necessarily be the same situation. But, you know, just as Candace was speaking, and it's always hard to come after Candace because she always blows me away with what she's saying. But one thing that I'm noticing is as newsrooms really shrink, and we've talked so much about we lose a lot of our diverse candidates as we lose you know, numbers in the newsroom because they tend to be the last ones in. But one thing I'm noticing as well is just in terms of the, the level of experience and the level of background that you don't see as much anymore in a lot of newsrooms. You don't have people past 35 that are out on the streets as much anymore. You know, at a certain age, we see a lot of us disappearing from the industry. And I think that that level of background starts to disappear with it. Hmm. Candace, um, do you have a thought on what she just said? Yeah, that's a, uh, so we don't talk a lot about age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a really important thing to talk about. I mean, you think about the number of people who leave actually in their mid thirties and then a few who stay, right? And so there is kind of an ossification that happens over time and you see it in, uh, in senior management. Um, and I think that that's a real challenge, right? Uh, especially as there's all of these questions being asked about, you know, who's in the newsroom and whether or not that matters and how it matters. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this is a really, it's a good observation, Tara, and one I, I haven't quite thought closely about. So it's worth thinking we, about them. We do lose a lot uh, when, when that happens and that's gotta have an impact on the newsrooms. I wanted to ask about um, resources or, or helping the people who are speaking up, like the extra work that is done, the translations, the requests to confirm the right degree of sensitivity for a community we're reporting on, uh, the emotions that need to be managed in the process, uh, whether it's your emotions or your colleagues' emotions. Um, what could meaningful resources be like if you, if you are running a newsroom and you know one person or two people seem to be the ones that everybody goes to, how do you provide support for that kind of person? Candace, we'll start with you and I wonder what everyone else thinks. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the thing I've often been asked, you know, how do we get more indigenous people in the newsroom? And I always say, bring two or three, you know, I have like a policy of not sitting on a board unless there's another indigenous cluster person. hiring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, it's amazing. Carlton has hired you and Adrian like, hey, yeah, this is the, <laughs> they know what's up. 
<laughs> this is the world we want to live in, right? Where you're not an only, where you're not a token. I mean, I can think about back to my uh, work as a journalist. I was an only a lot of the time. I mean, I was called, I always joke with my students, I was called a native intern for a long time and I never interned. The only part of it was true was the native part. Uh, so, you know, I, I think like this is, a, this is a real challenge is to support people and to recognize that journalism and methods and thinking about objectivity, all of those things, they still are very much evolving in terms of discussions in the newsroom, in terms of discussions in the profession. Um, and I've heard uh, a number of journalists talk about how objectivity gets weaponized. I teach with Pacinth Matar's piece in the walrus about this. I teach with, uh, you know, other pieces where people have really talked about this in, in powerful ways. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's still a lot of those conversations where uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, they, they need support to, to walk through those conversations and having others and, you know, having- So your answer is about bringing more on that cluster hire, even though we did just say, we don't want to just, we don't want to just be numbers, but if you're going to hire, Try to hire a number of people. Um, hire uh, and promote, right? We need people in senior positions. That's absolutely. Really I am with you there. Uh, Arvin, Reshmi, Tara, does anyone else have any ideas on how to support the people who are the ones who are uh, doing a lot of that kind of heavy lifting? I would say it's just the recognition of it in some ways. You know, I have worked in newsrooms where you only see a couple diverse people that you're working with and you often don't realize the burden that's being placed on them in many ways. And I don't know that it's recognized by the broader community. So that's one where one area I think that we could all do better. Um, as you were talking, I was just thinking, I don't know of another journalist in a wheelchair on TV in Canada, you know? So even when we try to think about a cluster hire, yeah. I, I don't know where they come from because I don't know where they are, you know, and I was, I've been doing it. How does that make you feel though? Like, what, what do you think of that? You know, at the end of the day, I, I never really think of tokenism or that sort of thing. Cause I don't mm -hmm. have all those other intersectionalities that it's ever occurred to me before, but you know, I, I think there is a bit of a loss when we talk about even just what we were saying with age, you know, when you have a very young workforce that's, that's doing the reporting, then what are their biases when they think even about seniors or they think about, you know, people with disabilities or, you know, there is a, a, that lack of just awareness and life experience sometimes that I think comes into play. Uh, yeah, if I could add, I would just like it documented, you know, everybody's doing the heavy lifting and telling you how to pronounce something or what something means, write it down, document it, put it into something that's resourceful for the next person. So it's not just like you're constantly helping people with diversity, inclusivity, whatever it is, and then it goes in one ear and out the other. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it has to be leadership. It's, it's, it's the leader in the room setting the tone for everyone to understand what is allowed and what isn't. And then, and then you go from there, right? So right now we're going from the ground up. And I feel like now with these discussions and, and people listening that they're gonna meet us from the top down and we're gonna be able to have that. I mean, and the document needs to change, but you know, every newsroom has some archaic resource on how to pronounce things. So just, add to that right but don't create a diversity database <laughs> like don't create a separate thing we don't want to be separated but just keep adding to it when when someone offers that value otherwise it just you just lose it and that's where i think people are exhausted with the heavy lifting hmm. Arvin, what just, about you? Um, yeah sorry i'm um, just a quick point as well um also if you like maybe this intersects with dara's point about recognition but compensate them because these are people who are doing this on top of the job that you expect them to do. Um, yeah, so I think it's recognition plus compensation because this is not just traumatic, this is also taking time out of their personal and family life. Arvin, I, I wanna um, keep you on for a second. Now, I wanna talk about how racialized journalists are talking among themselves. So we know that there's a lot of focus on black people, indigenous people and their relationships with white people, but how does this impact other racialized people, uh, folks who are biracial, multiracial, everyone who's in that wad swath that we call POC, people of color. So like, what are we missing in this conversation that we need to be aware of or remember? 
first of all, like your question about uh, how we speak to each other, it's fine. Um, we find joy in like misery almost. Um, but like jokes aside, I feel like there's also a lack of nuance in EDI conversations about how BIPOC treat each other, especially BIPOC who are in a position of power and how mo sometimes like if a BIPOC is in a position of power, they tend to operate using notions of white supremacy, which means you oppress other BIPOC as well. So, and that's another conversation that we rarely talk about, how BIPOC inflicts hurt to another BIPOC. And so to me, I think the, the what we need to do about that is, it means that the, everything that we are learning and that we're telling other people to go and learn, we have to learn ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, 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 the white supremacy, those kinds of um, the attitudes and how they show up and how we lead, we have to rid ourselves of that too. Reshmi, I see you nodding a lot. Um, uh, I see everyone nodding actually. Um, and I wonder how we do that because it is very easy to think that I am part of a community. I know what's up over here. So I don't need to learn about that other stuff. You know what, you, you, you check yourself. I, I am so lucky to have this ombuds position because it puts me in check every time. But like what Arvin's talking about, it reminds me of when I, I started in a radio newsroom in Vancouver and we had a new reporter and she was crying in the newsroom and my female news director pulled me aside and said, can you talk to her? And I pulled her aside and you know what I said to her? I said, there's no crying in the newsroom. And I taught her how to be as tough as the white men we worked around, but now, I'm older and I'm thinking, what's wrong with crying in the newsroom? If you're stressed out and something's bothering you, cry, right? So that's a change. That's just within my two ears, how things have changed. I would say that at, at, the, at the beginning of my career, I was trying to fit in with that strong, smart, white journalist because I looked up to them. And we're starting to become those role models for other people and other generations. And we can do that but we have to change what we thought was the definition of success as well. So it's, it's between our two ears, I think. And, and, you know, just trying to find ways to do that. That's where I'm saying I'm grateful for my role because if, if I wasn't getting involved in this, I would feel too much on the sidelines, right? We're all involved in trying to improve journalism and, and our daily coverage. So just get your fingers dirty. Candace, do you have a response for this? Yeah, I have a complex one, actually. I, I mean, I think that journalism hasn't been very relational, right? It hasn't mm. been about relationships as much as, um, you know, telling stories is about sorting through multiple perspectives. And I think that's reflected in a lot of socialization in the newsroom, right? Uh, where there isn't that kind of relational aspect to it. Everyone's, you know, in a competitive environment for sure, but um, you know, I think there's there's a, a piece missing there. And when we did um, research with Indigenous journalists for the Reckoning book, uh, one of the things that was really powerful about what Indigenous journalists were doing differently was that they were recognizing that they were situated in relationships, both, you know, to the communities that they were reporting on, but to sort of, you know, each other and recognizing that their journalism has an impact, but also their relations really mattered, like the how mattered as much as the what. This reminds me of, um, there's a journalist, I think an, an, a, a few of us know, her name is Garvia Bailey, and she's also a really good friend of mine. And um, she often talks about care in journalism and that right now she's focused on making sure that the how of what we do um, is, is so intentional. And um, perhaps what you're talking about, Candace, is one of the ways that we can change things is that if we remember that while we are producing a product, we are also with other humans <laughs> and these other humans are coming from somewhere and, and have their thoughts and beliefs and sh and joys and fears and, and all of that. Um, but um, Tara, what, when you think of this, do, does it seem like a heavy lift making this kind of a change? In some ways, no, I think these conversations are really helping. And I think the groundswell we've been seeing over the last year and a half would is really propelling it in that direction in a big way. I mean, 
one thing that keeps sticking back to me is the shrinking of newsrooms. And it gets really hard as we see workloads increasing for people not to be able, like for people to be able to take that extra time to check in with each other and to support each other, because, you know, there is a lot of frustration in your day often, and there is a lot of um, scrambling to a deadline, you know, especially in daily news. And so I think that's where we are still going to face a bit of a roadblock just in terms of the ability to exert any more of yourself when you're, when it comes to helping others. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's a very real consideration. A very real consideration. I want to talk um, a bit about some other some other changes outside of newsrooms, but elsewhere in the industry, specifically awards. So uh, many of you may not be aware, people who are, are listening, but the National Newspaper Awards were award- awarded, and uh, a great a number of great journalists and uh, great journalism part that was part of it also overwhelmingly white. And after the awards, the organization issued a tweet thread stating that it has an important role to play in addressing systemic barriers to equity and opportunity in the Canadian journalism sector. And then it cited an audit that uh, it did on itself and said that it confirmed its belief that the awards program has not come close to reflecting Canada's diversity. Now, I'm aware that um, the the NNAs are, 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 working with justice and journalism which is an equity committee representing journalists from the Globe and Mail and Toronto Star and other newspapers so the question I have for the panel is what is your reaction to that if you have one and what kind of changes can be made to the way awards are issued in our industry and if you think it doesn't matter you can say that too you know it matters (laughs) it matters a lot and I can tell me that I my Okay, so I started interning in a local television and radio newsroom back in high school, but then I had a car accident and it felt like a job that I wasn't going to be able to do anymore. And so I went back to university and that's why I did English and anthropology as opposed to journalism. And, you know, I ended up winning the global scholarship for someone with a physical disability and that brought me back in. And I think they're so important to open the door. Candice. You were going to say something? Yeah, it's not surprising, right? Uh, so uh, when we have had the industry makeup that we have had, which is mostly white and male up until, you know, a couple of or two or three decades ago, and you start to see more women come into the newsroom, it's not surprising. Uh, I have to tell you, I've been asked to be on an, uh, several juries. And the first thing I do is look at who's won in the past and then ask them, you know, why there's been so few. And, and, and I think what answer do you get? <laughs> we're working to change that. And uh, then do they change it? Well, um, you know, the other thing is that in some cases there aren't many uh, BIPOC people who apply for uh some of the awards. Um, and, so perhaps and, that's where we need to change things. So both. Why is that people, happening? Well, I think people need to have the confidence and the awareness of awards to apply for them. Um, but I also think we need, you know, more diverse juries, right? We need, you know, like it has to change across the board. It's not sort of one or two little fixes, um, you know, as newsrooms become hopefully hopefully more diverse, right? Uh, The numbers don't reflect that yet, but hopefully become more diverse Then all of these things need to change that are associated with the industry, especially when it comes to demarcating what's quality, right? That's what, that's what awards do. What's the quality journalism? Go Reshmi, you want to say something? I I appreciated um, that the NNA also said that they're going to encourage the news organizations that enter the contest to highlight the work of a more diverse cohort of journalists when they submit their entries I know amazing journalists who have won incredible awards, but their names were never in the submissions because they were just omitted and they are BIPOC. So who is submitting for the awards? Whose names are going on the submissions? Those I think need to be supervised because anyone can just take claim. And when you look at the names on those awards in the foyers of certain newsrooms, you'll notice that they're only a certain group of people, but you know that it took a team and you know that the sub leadership role, the person who was putting it all together was probably a BIPOC person, probably the hardest working person on the team. I'm speaking from the experiences I've heard from people. So it needs to be supervised. It needs to be encouraged and it definitely needs to change the way that they submit 
for awards. Arvin, what about you? All, yeah, um, also I feel like we also have to acknowledge that a lot of BIPOC journalists work as freelancers. It's just a reality. They don't find themselves like in newsrooms yet. And so making these awards accessible because they're expensive, even if they allow people to submit like by themselves, it still requires money. So there's that factor as well. So if you're a freelancer who's really like your projects don't come as often, then how will you allocate money to send your work to awards? Hmm. Maybe we need to start something for that. I'm getting ideas. Candice, uh, I want to turn our attention to uh, journalism education for a moment. Uh, we're here talking about strengthening Canadian journalism, and you've noted a lack of knowledge of historical context. So how do we, how can we change that through journalism education? Yeah, great question. And one Oh, and I I've been told that we only have four minutes, so make it quick and make it okay. good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, Mary Lynn Young and I talk about in the Reckoning book is that journalists need to locate themselves, but oftentimes they don't have a very in-depth sense of their own social location, of their location in history, of the location of media in history, right? Uh, I teach with Seeing Red, a history of natives in newspapers, which was by uh, Carmen Robertson and Mark Anderson. And I think like these sorts of contributions need to be taught in journalism schools. We've got to start to understand what role media has played in propping up social orders in colonialism, um, you know, and, and understand the power of representation Presentation. So part of that involves sort of, you know, direct understanding of history, but the other is really understanding the role of media in, in representational history and what we mean when we say prior journalisms and the kind of harms that they've done. Uh, we have a number of questions that are, that are coming in, but there, I know that there's one that is very popular and that is whether or not one can be both an activist and a journalist. Um, Candice, I know you have an answer to this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always point to Desmond Cole's amazing book, The Skin We're In, because I think that he really discusses it in a, in a powerful way. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in journalism, we've really done a lot of work around defining what journalism is and what the role of journalism is. We haven't done a lot of work around understanding what advocacy is and what constitutes activism. And so I think that that is work that still needs to be done and those conversations need to be had. But, you know, essentially, I think that if you are coming from a community that can't automatically label you as an activist. If you're calling out racist behavior, that can't label you as an activist, right? And so I think that there, there's also some questions to be asked around what journalism, what journalism does in terms of its its own kind of advocating for, you know, certain kinds of uh, values in society for social orders. Like there, there's a really, there's a whole bunch of complex questions that come about that you can't just answer, you know, are you an activist? Can you be both? Um, and so I think those conversations are still to be had and they're being had by, you know, uh, journalists like Desmond Cole, like Tanya Talaga, who are doing the kind of work that I think is really representative of the kinds of journalism we want to see in the world that's making change, that's addressing systemic oppression. Now, um, thank you so much for, for that, Candice. And I'm supposed to hand things over, but I'm just going to beg on behalf of everybody. Jennifer, can we please have five more minutes? Please, please, can we just have five more minutes? Because I want to get to one of these questions. Is that possible? Anybody? We don't have the time, but maybe you can uh, get it in tight. Okay, a, a really quick one. Okay, so one of the questions here is, um, What are tips for allyship as a white journalist? Let's make that a quick one. Thank you, Jennifer. Rashmi, you're shaking Just your care. head. Just What's care. That? Just care, right? Like use your two ears and listen and care. Walk, okay, but what does that mean? Walk two Sorry. minutes in my shoes. Like don't not believe me, right? It, that's that's part of it is, is just take what I'm saying as, as truth. Don't keep questioning. I'm thinking about... Um, my friend from Hong Kong who really tried to get coverage of the umbrella protest and then everything else that happened in Hong Kong in the years to come. And the newsroom producers, writers, bosses, everyone would just be like, mm, but it's coming from her. Like, stop doing that, right? Just 
take it as it is for information okay. and treat us as journalists. Tara. And just a quick one. Oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, like aside from listening, caring, um, I just want to remind um, allies that we are not attacking you. Um, when we talk about institutions, it's not about you. It's not personal. It is a system of oppression. It's not personal. That's just it. Okay, Tara. You know, I'm I'm in an interesting position in that I'm still learning about this too. You know, there's been, I feel like over the last year, so many of us have just had our eyes awakened in ways in which we've been forced to. And that's really great. And it's been a long time coming. And I think at the end of the day, what Rashmi is even just saying, just take the time to stop and notice how somebody else is um, having to take on that workload or having to present things, you know, and, and, and back them up essentially and say, I think that's a great idea. You know, that was that whole thing under the Obama administration of women amplifying each other's ideas. And sometimes I think it comes down to that, just helping amplify each other and their concerns as well as their requests. Okay. I'm, I think I'm going to leave it there unless Candace, you got something burning. You're good. Okay. Well, thank you so much to everyone here, the entire panel. I appreciate your conversation and your candor. You've all given us a lot to consider. Um, and thank you to the Walrus for having me as your moderator. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Bakan. Thanks so much, Nanaba. Well done. Uh, thanks for a fantastic uh, discussion. Thanks to all, uh, to all our fantastic uh, panelists. It was truly remarkable, eh? so rich and uh, uh, to, to me, uh, as a university president, it was striking that a lot of the challenges that were raised and the solutions proposed are, are true and applicable to academia as well, and, and I expect to uh, many other uh, sectors. Uh, there were so many powerful points uh, made, and, and different aspects of the conversations will be meaningful to different people. Uh, very early in the panel, uh, the importance of representation was raised, and that's obvious, no question. Uh, but then immediately it was said very rightly that just hiring somebody is not enough. You need to be able to provide the condition for that person to belong, to be able to contribute to the best of their abilities. And, and how do you do that? That's not easy. That requires a comprehensive strategy and sustained uh, work over time. So th thank you for getting into that important question. Then I, I really enjoyed the middle part uh, about how to raise issues and push for positive change. Uh, within organization. And of course, the flip side of that is how do organizations set themselves up uh, so that these issues are well received and that you can take advantage of people rightly raising these important issues to change positively. And, and it's so interesting to me that journalism and academia, two sectors where we pr pride ourselves in open conversations and debate, we struggle uh, to do this well. Uh, I think we're getting better for sure. And the leadership team has a big responsibility for creating the right space and the right conditions for these debates to happen, uh, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, finally, I was fascinated at the end uh, by your discussion on the issue of awards or, or whatever form prestige it takes in, in your uh, sector. Who gives these awards? On what criteria? Uh, to what aim? Uh, what are these awards supposed to achieve and, and to whom uh, are these awards uh, given? The, these decisions define by definition what success uh, is and what prestige is in all fields. And we need to make sure that these awards are not a way to enforce a certain status quo, but in fact, quite the opposite, that they become a vehicle for positive change. So uh, I, I know the conversation won't end here. Uh, this is very much a starting point uh, for action. Uh, that's what matters uh, across our sectors and across uh, society. And it's our shared responsibility uh, each and every one of us to work uh, to work towards uh, equity, inclusion, diversity, belonging, and that's what we're trying to do at Carleton University, uh, with lots more to be done. So many thanks to the Walrus uh, for hosting us today. Uh, great discussion. Uh, can't thank the panelists uh, enough, and uh, Nanaba, so well done. Uh, congratulations, and again, welcome to Carleton. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank you day. so much, Dr. Bakan. Also, thanks again to our speakers, Candace Callison, Arvin Joaquin, Rashmi Nair, Tara Weber. And of course, thanks to our moderator today, Nanaba Duncan. As someone just said in chat, you're the best. We agree. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, Shaw and Facebook Canada. And thank you to our audience for joining us from home. We appreciate all the comments and questions in chat, and hopefully we covered a good range of the topics that you brought up. If you enjoyed today's event, we have more coming up. On Tuesday, May 18th, Facebook presents the Walrus Talks at Home Voices Online, 
And on Wednesday, May 26, TD Bank Group presents the Walrus Talks at Home Resilience. Check in at the walrus.ca slash events. You can see our event schedule and register. We also have videos from events. We'll post videos from today. And keep an eye on your inbox. You're gonna receive an email as a follow-up. If you'd like to attend future events like this one, make sure to subscribe and opt in for our newsletter. At The Walrus, we believe that trustworthy journalism really is an essential service. And with your support, we can provide fact check long form journalism that Canadians can rely on. So if you enjoyed this free event today, please consider making a donation online at thewalrus.ca. All gifts, $20 or more, will receive a, a tax receipt. Community is so important in these COVID times, and each one of you is part of The Walrus. Thanks again for making time today and connecting. Have a good day ahead. Bye, everyone.